my Savior God to thee how great thou art if you know this song sing it how great thou art then sing my soul my Savior God
come and lift your voice. We bless you, God. Hear the voices of your children this morning. How great thou art. We bless you, God. We bless you. How great thou art. How great thou art. We bless you, Lord. How great. How great is our God everybody say sing with me how great is our God, is our God. and all will sing it all will sing us. is God really great to you if he is lift your voice how great, great is our God is our God one more time and lift our voice and say how great how great is our God. Sing with me, sing with me, sing with me. How great is our God. And all will sing. How great. How great. You have the Choose to say how great is our God. How great is our God. One more time, you have the name, you have the name above any other name. You have the name and you are worthy. worthy. Verse 22 to 23, if you're there. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. You are worthy of my praise. And my heart and my mind and my life, it will choose to say that you are great. Yes. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Verse 22 again says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you speak to our spirits, speak to our minds. Father, may you have your way in our lives. We pray that you do a work in us. Father, thank you for giving us precious gifts in this church that have led us into your presence in worship. Father, it is amazing and beautiful to go into your presence, even just burdened with a lot, but when we enter your presence and when we have an awesome encounter in worship with you, we feel those burdens lifted. 
So Father, I ask that even as the worship has done its part, Father, I pray may the word also do its part, whatever you have ordained for the word to do. So Father, I pray that may the word go forth and may it speak to the lives of your people directly. May they be able to grab from it so that they just won't be listeners of the word, but they may be able to be doers of the word. Father, I pray that may this word transform myself and every person listening. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, who's happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. 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 God bless. Let's give it up for Capital Worship. Such an awesome time. I was, I was talking to a member at the church one time, and they were like, so why is it that, like, when Capital Worship does it, then you got to do another 15 minutes? I'll say, it's not my fault. It's not, it's not my fault. Like, when it's that, when, when you just want to stay in the presence of God, it just, sometimes you just want to bask. And I just thank God we have gifts in this church that are able to lead us into such a realm, you know. So let's give it up for Capital Worship again that is, that is able to lead us into the realm. Amen. Last week, we learned about the fruit of the Spirit. And Elder Sam did an amazing job breaking down what it truly meant um, to have uh, God or have the Holy Spirit in us that develops this Holy Spirit. Yeah, I mean, sorry, the, the Holy Spirit develops these fruits in our lives so that we can become more like Christ. And it was such a powerful message. And what he touched on was um, love. Anybody can tell me what he touched on? I gave you one. It was love, joy, and peace. And it was very powerful. I remember when I was uh, planning and preparing this message, I, I realized that when it comes to those three fruits, um, it has so much to do with the inward approach. Like, you know, you have peace, you know, I have joy and um, I have love. I, I have that agape love. Like I said, that kind of love that, you know, loves irrespective of what you do or what somebody has done. And when I look at, you know, especially joy and peace, those things are inward uh, things right um, when I say inward it's like you can come to church and smile but if I don't know your story or I don't see what you do in your closet you can fool me and I can think that maybe you're a joyful person or that you have peace in your heart but when we come to these three other fruits that we're going to talk about it's, it has more of an outward approach and these three uh, fruits is one patience two kindness and then goodness. Um, if you're patient, I'm going to be able to see in how you deal with me. If you're kind, I'm going to be able to see based upon how you deal with me. And then I'll know if you're a good person, if you carry that nature of goodness based upon how you treat others and how you say my yes is my yes or my no is my no. So last week, it was dealing more with the inward approach, but this time we're talking about the outward, how we deal with one another. Amen. And my prayer is that if any of us struggle with this, we will be able to allow the Holy Spirit to cultivate these, this fruit so that we will become more patient, we become more kind, and show forth more goodness. Amen. Now, today in the message, what I want, what I want to do is, because we understand that this comes from God. Like you can't exhibit these things outside of God, which Elder Sam told us. So I want to, us to see how God the Father exhibits these fruits. How God the Son, Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, how he also exhibited these fruits. And then how the Holy Spirit, which comes from the Father, right, and uh, lives in us, is able to help us develop these fruits. Amen. So to go straight to the point, the first fruit that we said is the fruit of patience. Somebody say patience. patience. Now the Greek word for patience in this context is macro, sorry, macrothumia. Macrothumia. Everybody say with me, macrothumia. Let's do it one more time. Macrothumia. And if I got it wrong, 
It's all good. I'm from Ghana. I ain't, I ain't from, you know, I, I don't speak, I don't speak that language. Amen. But um, I don't speak Greek, so it's, it's all good. But it's macrothemia, right? Did I change it again? It's all good. We, we bless you. You get the point. Amen. Now, um, basically what it means is long suffering. Say long suffering. And forbearance. Somebody say forbearance. All right. Now, patience as a fruit of the spirit, right, is one. The ability to endure for a long time whatever opposition and suffering may come our way. And to show perseverance without wanting retaliation. Now, listen, it says without wanting retaliation. There's a difference between retaliating and then wanting to. Now, the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of people in the flesh that your flesh can sometimes limit you or restrain you from actually doing something. So you, sometimes you say that if I didn't know God, bro, I would have punched you. If I didn't know God, sis, I would have smacked you, right? So you're saying that the absence of God or the absence of the Holy Spirit, if it was up to your flesh alone, you would have gone ahead and smacked somebody. But what this is teaching us is that when the Holy Spirit develops patience in your life, it doesn't just allow you to not do something. It allows you to also not think something. So that is what Jesus was saying when he said that when a man looks at another woman, maybe that's not his wife, and he's married, and he's thought about it in his head, he has already done it. It means that what Christ came to do was that the Old Testament said, you didn't have to do it. Christ is saying, no, you don't even have to think it. But the power to not think it comes from the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. So we're saying not wanting to retaliate not oh i just i want to but because of god i'm not going to no it's saying not wanting to i want to get to a place whereby if you get on my nerves i don't i won't just say bro you get on my nerves i'm about to hit you no you get on my nerves it's okay because christ forgave me i forgive you too see it sounds funny because to the flesh it don't make sense but we say you can't do good without God. So if the Holy Spirit is not helping you, then you won't be able to do it. So that's why my prayer is that may the Spirit of God cultivate this fruit so that we will come to a place of not thinking and not doing. So the second definition is the ability to put up with the weaknesses. Somebody say the weaknesses. And the issues of others, including other believers. And to show forbearance toward them without getting quickly irritated or angry enough to want to fight back. Amen. So God the Father also exemplified that fruit of patience. I'll prove it to you. Open the Bible to Psalm 103, verse 8 to 10. The Bible says, we have a lot of scripture today, so I'm going to go quickly through it. Psalm 103, verse 8 to 10. The Bible says, the Lord is merciful and gracious. Listen, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us. This is one of my favorite verses. He does not deal with us. Uh, let, me, let me repeat that again. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. I know what this means. Somebody saw me one day and said that because maybe you didn't save yourself to a marriage, why is it that you got married and you were able to have a child right away? It means that if it was up to people, they will handle us according to our issues and sins. But God is saying, I do not repay you according to your iniquities. So scripture also says that when we come to God, he remembers our sins no more. So that's why I love being on God's side. Being on man's side, we're always keeping a tally of something. But God is saying that when it comes to me, if you want to do how I do it, you can't do it by yourself. You need the spirit, that Holy Spirit that will cultivate and develop the fruit of patience so that you can also love the way I love. But the Bible here says that the Lord, our God, this is the Old Testament. This is God. The, they're talking about God. And he's saying that God is slow to anger. And he's abounding in steadfast love. The nature of God is that he doesn't get mad too quick. And he's always abounding in steadfast love. 
How do we know this is true? Yes, scripture shows us, but let's also look at another scripture in, jo- in Jonah. If you look at Jonah chapter, uh, I believe chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. I'm going to read that and then verse 10. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. We all know the story of Jonah. God tells Jonah, go to Nineveh and go and preach to the people and to them to turn from their wicked ways. We all know, homie was like, I'm not going. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm out of here. The Bible says he gets on a boat. When he gets on that boat, the boat begins to shake. It begins to do crazy things because there was a storm. What I like about that story is that Jonah confessed himself and said that the only reason the storm is here is because I'm on the boat. That's another message for another day. Some people are on your boat and that's why there are storms. But that's a charismatic, that's a charismatic preaching today. Let's, let's, let's keep it to the word. Sometimes the storms you go, uh, that's happening in your life, it's not because of you. Look, they were chilling. Everything was good. Once he got on the boat, there was an issue. So sometimes check, check, check the people around you. That's, that's, another, that's another message. Not what we're talking about today. But to, <laughs> what we're talking about today, though, is that God called Jonah to go. Gets on the boat. There's an issue. They're like, bro, we need to throw you off. He's like, yes, just throw me off. He, throw, he throws him off. And then the Bible says that a well comes and then what? Uh, yeah, I was going to say eat him up, but swallows him, puts him in the belly, right? Now, we see here in Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, the Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in bread. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he and he called out, yet for 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It says, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh, listen, believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented. Somebody say relented. Of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he did not do it. So we see here that God had a punishment out for them. But he just needed somebody to go out and and just give them a word and let them turn around. When they decided to turn around, God decided to chill out and not burn them all out. That's the beauty and the grace of God. But look at the reason. Now, if I I ask somebody here, why did Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? The person said, I had like four people. You know, only one person got it right. They're like, it's because of fear, right? Who believes this fear? Oh, don't be a fear. Oh, it's okay. Who, who believes this fear? Okay, God bless you. God bless you. And I was like, it's fear. It's fear. And I said, God bless you. I'm sure that had something to do with it, but the, the Bible will tell us exactly what it was. So when you go to Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, the Bible says this is the reason why Jonah didn't want to go. Because, and this reason is going to show you the character of God and who God is. He says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. Look, we came from verse 10 in chapter 3. He was upset. What was wrong to him? That the people had the ability to turn from their wicked ways. So he says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. Why? Because people had the ability to also experience the forgiveness of God. That's what made Jonah mad. So listen, he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord? When I was still at home, when I was chilling in my crib and you called me, this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to tarnish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Listen, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. It is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah didn't want to go. It wasn't because of fear. He didn't think that the people of Nineveh deserved the grace of God. He didn't think they deserved it. Because he knew the character of God. He knew that once they hear the word and they will turn from their wicked ways, God will forgive them. So it shows us that patience, long-suffering, uh, forbearance is the character of God. That any time people decide to turn away from their wicked ways, God is always ready to receive them. To the point that Jonah said, this is why I didn't want to go. 
And then God said, is this a reason to be angry? And this is a picture of the church, picture of self-righteous people who think that God is only for them and their family. They think that God is only for them and their church. God is for anybody that will turn from their wicked ways. It is the nature of God to save every person. He would wish that no man would perish. That is the nature of God. That is who God is. And the Bible says, so like, I, I was saying, take my, take my life, bro? Is it that serious, Jonah? Take my life? Because God was able to save people that you thought couldn't be saved? That is why, that is what men do. Men will size you up according to your history. Men and women will size you up according to what they've heard. They've not even t- had to have time to talk to you and to ask you your, your opinion, ask you about what may have happened, and may, maybe ask my story. You may just hear why I went through what I went through. What they do is they just think about, hey, if I were saved, that's fine, but I'm not going to extend that grace. And then they get upset when the person that they thought was in the club is now preaching the gospel and they're still sitting on the pews. God can use anybody. Why? For his nature is ready to receive people who we would have written off. He's saying that you can come in. As long as they turn from their wicked ways. And Jonah knew that. And that's why he said he wasn't going. Is that fair? Think about it. To the point that you... God bless you for the answer, bro. (laughs) No, but like, it's serious. Like, I want to kill myself because these people got grace? It may sound funny, but some people are killing themselves inwardly at the fact that God is using them and not and using you and not them. People are upset because they think God's grace is only for them. But his grace, his nature is patient and is waiting for every person to say, Lord, I turn for my wicked ways. And if you are still in your wicked ways, I pray that as you understood that God is ready to receive you, may you be able to turn from your wicked ways and come to God for he's able to receive you and keep you. So God's nature is seeing that he has patience all over him. Now Jesus, the son of God, was also patient. Jesus, when you look at how he worked with people, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, we see here that uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 and 15 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. I like that. Some of us, we think that God is slow. No, 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 no. Your understanding of slow is not what God, how God operates. For a day is like a thousand days. A thousand days is like a day. And when God chooses to show up, he makes it beautiful. But that's another time, another message. But what we're talking about today is that instead he is patient with you. I like that. He said it's not that he's slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. But instead he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with you the wisdom that God gave him. Second Peter 3, 9, and then verse 15 as well. It tells us that this is, you got to understand who's right. Peter is writing this. And Peter truly understands that God, Jesus is patient. How does he know this? Because when he went to Jesus and said, Jesus, we should run this town. We should take over. When we get here, where do we sit? I mean, his mom, everybody was trying to get in a certain position with Jesus because they saw that he had power. And Jesus looked at him and said, bro, Satan, get, get, Satan, get thee behind me. And then he tells him that, look, Peter, look, I've prayed for you that the enemy will not swift you. But even if you, when you fall, You'll be able to get back up and strengthen your brothers, right? Now, he has an understanding of the patience of God. When somebody's writing, it's more credible when the person has gone through the actual experience. He's saying that I walked with Jesus, and I remember when there was a time that he could have just let me go. But when I denied him three times, he still showed up at where we were fishing and said, drop this and feed my sheep. Jesus was waiting patiently, even though I made a mistake more than once. Even when they were coming to arrest him and it was to fulfill scripture, I took a sword and cut the the ear off of the person that was coming to, 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 to take him away. But Peter said that even after all of that, he still was patient with me. 
And Peter's like, now I'm writing to churches. I'm one who denied him. I'm the one that had the wrong mindset about his ministry on earth, but he still uses me. That shows that Jesus is patient with people's weaknesses. You must ask yourself, when people's weaknesses show up, are you ready to throw them away? Are you ready to just draw them in? Are you ready to keep walking with them? Or are you just like, bro, I have no time for you. You irritate me. And just walking with you stresses me out. I can't bear your, your, your annoyance. I can't bear your presence. When you're around me, things happen. Do we say that or do we tell people that if Jesus had time for me, I should also have time for you? Patience. Paul also says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, he says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Paul is saying that I'm writing to you, I'm an apostle of Christ, even though I was a murderous man, even though I was a blasphemer. Jesus didn't look at where I was coming from, but he didn't even wait for me to change. He just showed up on the way to Damascus and changed my life he was waiting for me and he said I'm ready to change your life he was patient think about it Paul was on his way to go and kill people and Jesus stopped him on the way some of you are waiting to get your life right he don't need all that he's just waiting for you to just say Lord I surrender he's waiting patiently patiently for you there's a scripture in Romans it says that it is the kindness and the forbearance of the Lord, right, that it extends, it is stretched out so that people can come to repentance. So some of you are thinking that, man, you know what, I'm just doing me. Or some people, you're looking at some people say that this person, nothing good can come from that person. Or this person, look at what they're doing. They'll never be good. This person, I worry for them. I'm telling you, sometimes God is just waiting and has a plan. And he's just doing something. He's just doing And Paul is saying that for me, to be writing to you, only Timothy, about who Jesus is, shows you that he was patient for me. That's why Travis Green's song, I love it so, he's like, he, he, you know that song, because um, he waited, that song is just, it's just like, waited, waited, you waited, wait, and it's so beautiful because it's true, some of us, God waited for us. Some of y'all didn't think you'd be where you are, but it was the patience of God. He didn't, he didn't strike you out when you, when you, when you had sex that, that day you knew it was wrong. He said, I'll be patient. My grace is, I, I, I'll, be, I'll be patient. There's a plan for this person. So if this is what Jesus is doing for us, why are we doing different for others? I would say, who born you by mistake? What makes you think you can now lift up your head and look at us and, and look at others and say, this person can, can, who are you to condemn? The patience of God is what we need. So we pray for them. We console them. We don't leave them alone. We don't, we don't condemn them because Jesus didn't do that. And if Jesus didn't do it and he's our example, then we must do what he also did with the men like Peter and Paul. Jesus was also long-suffering. First Peter chapter 2, verse 20, the Bible says here that... Uh, but how is it to your credit? First Peter 2, verse 20 to 24. But how is it to your credit if you are receiving a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you. Leaving you an example, I love that, that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Verse 23 says, when they hurled um, their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to, whom, to him who judges justly. 24 says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So what Peter is saying here is that, that there's no credit for a man being beaten if he's done something wrong. So if you've done something wrong, you deserve to get beat. You deserve to get smacked up. That's just what it is. You deserve to go to jail if you've done something wrong. But credit goes to the person who has done nothing wrong and is beaten for that. 
And why do we notice it happened to Christ? Christ did nothing wrong, but for some reason, and we know what that reason is, because there was a plan to save us. But at that moment, they didn't really know what was going on. They just made things up, and Jesus had every opportunity to say something, but he chose to keep his mouth quiet. How was that possible? Because Jesus was long-suffering. He was able to go through things. He was able to go through situations without chain. I, 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 need, I need to help myself. No, he was able to go through it because there was a greater purpose ahead. And you need, and it's the fruit of the spirit, it cultivates that. It develops that. It develops long suffering because you too will go through it. If you serve Christ the right way, you will be canceled. If you serve Christ the right way, people will talk about you. When you serve Christ the right way, your money will be short and you will have to be able to suffer. But understand that you're suffering for a good thing. And a lot of people are not able to. They call themselves pastors and they find out talking to people, what do you think about this? I don't, I don't know, man. God is a judge. No, the scripture tells you, just say the scripture. Just say the scripture. But why? Everybody's worried about suffering because there's a gospel that's being preached that when you come to Christ, everything is okay. Or sometimes you allow your selfishness to get the best of you and you want to be thinking about securing the bag or becoming great or having followers. So for that reason, you're not meant to suffer. So who are you serving, Christ or yourself? Who are you serving? Who is your master? If he is the great example, then he suffered. And we must also suffer too. In America, it's not like China. China, you're preaching right now, they'll come and collect you and go to jail. It's not like that here. Here is they'll cancel you. Twitter will have a day with your life. Twitter, you will be a hashtag Cancel Yahweh cancel Doreen, cancel EB. They will have time. Bro, everybody will speak so bad about you. But what you have to realize is that there's a spirit inside of you that is cultivating a long suffering. It's cultivating patience that even if you go through that, you will still have joy even in that situation. Why? There's a spirit that comforts you and a spirit that helps you go through those things. But some of us, we're too excited about Followers, we're too excited about what I'm going to get. We're, we're too excited about everybody getting on. Look, I don't want no problems. I don't want no beef. I just want to be in my corner. If you come to serve Christ, look at what happened to the disciples, bro. That's what I'm saying. The stuff we're going through is nothing compared to them. So, bro, if you can't do it in America, how much more Iraq? I was, t- I was telling the guys in the back. I was like, bro. There's some preachers I just don't listen to. Why? They'll sit down, my bad. They'll, they'll sit down and they'll be on Breakfast Club. Sit down with Oprah. Agreeing on everything that they have to say just so that they can gain the acceptance of the world. That is not a true follower of Christ. And America can make you so chill. It can make, it's easy to be a Christian here. And sometimes, I was telling somebody, you, even if you look deep, some of us are not even Christians. Sorry to say. If you look deep, if you ask somebody, say, do you believe this is what the word says? No, nah, I mean, not really. I just think I need to, you need to mind your business and just do your own thing. That's not what I ask you. What we're asking is, what does the scripture say about a situation? It's not about how I feel. But when you're worried about how people feel about you, then you begin to change your feelings and emotions to go against against Christ and you stand with the world. And Christ never becomes the example. But but Peter is saying that he's the example. He had long suffering. And you should have it too. So don't think because you're a Christian, it's going to be easy. If Christ ain't getting easy, you're not supposed to get it easy. You're not. Somebody say you're not supposed to get it easy. Oh, I hope, I, hope I'm, I hope I'm not, you know, upsetting anybody here. I'm just, just letting you know what, what Scripture is saying. It's, just, it's saying that if Jesus went through it, we should expect to also what? Go through it. If Jesus went through it. So when Christians suffer, number one, it shouldn't be a surprise. Somebody said it shouldn't be a surprise. If you're going through suffering, don't be shocked. Jesus went through it, you will also go through it. If you're really serving him, then your life must, must resemble what he went through. He was misunderstood. You will be misunderstood. Even though he was telling the truth. Uh, people will talk about you. Even though he was telling the truth. That's the life. So in our times, if they did it in the synagogues, they're going to do it to us on Twitter and Instagram. So if everybody gets along with you, worldly people as well, then, then there might be a problem. There really might be a problem. 
But if we allow the Holy Spirit to birth in us long-suffering, we'll be able to go ahead. So one, you shouldn't be surprised. Number two, no retaliation. Don't fight back. When people are talking about you, keep focus. If you know the truth is the truth, just keep going. I always tell people, lies cannot be found, but truth can always be found one way or the other. And the truth will appear one day. Lies only appear as long as you keep saying the same. But truth, you don't have to say a word. It, it is a spirit. It appears. Truth is a spirit, guys. Whatever has happened, has happened. And it can appear one way or the other. That's why we say whatever you do in the dark can always come to. Why? Because truth is a spirit. It's a spirit, guys. The truth is, is, is Christ himself. It's Christ himself. So you don't retaliate. When people talk about you, look, I, has anybody watched the movie Belly? Belly? Dang, I'm old, bro. I'm really old. DMX, Nas, uh, you ain't seen that joint? Okay. Somebody's scared to lift their hand. I'm like, yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just, I only watched it once, bro, just once. It was, but I, I, there was a term I got. There's this dude from New York in the Bronx. Had this heavy Bronx accent. DMX was beating him up. And I've always, I always, t I use this phrase because I know truth is a spirit. He got beat up and something happened. And he knew that DMX was about to get killed later on. So they embarrassed the guy, stripped him naked. And he kept saying this, you going you to get yours, B. You going to get yours, B. If it happened, you get yours. So me and my brother, I tell him, I'm like, bro, you going to get yours, B. Gonna, like, what does that mean? It means that in life, whatever has happened is going to come back and bite you, bro. No, I'm saying, I always say, I'm like, bro, he says something, like, all right, bro, you going to get yours, B. That's it. You going to get yours. You going to get yours. So because I always tell the truth, like the truth always appears. So you don't need to talk. You don't need to say, defending yourself doesn't even help people. People, you talk, and they're like, they already made up their mind to, to, to cast you out. They already made up their mind to not like you. So it's, it's better for the, for the defense to not come from your mouth. It is better for truth to just come out because nobody can fight truth. They'll say that you're defending yourself because you want to get out of trouble. But when truth appears, it appears for the righteous. It appears for those that stand with Christ. So when you're going through so much, let them talk about you. Jesus was spit upon, he just let it go. Jesus was talked about, he let it go. Jesus, they, they whipped him, he didn't say anything. Even though he didn't do anything, but at the end when he resurrected on the third day, the same people that crucified him said they would want to be saved. The truth will appear. For Jesus, it was three days. For you, it could be one year. For you, it could be 10 years. It could be one month. It could be one day. Whatever it is, the truth shall appear. The truth shall appear. Number three, no quitting. Don't quit. Don't quit. Jesus didn't quit. They kept beating him. They kept beating him. He kept going. He kept going. He's our example. He kept going. And because he was able to keep going, God gave him a name that was greater than every other name. Your glorification will be seen. Look, don't think that today is the end of your story. Keep going because tomorrow is a better day. If God is on the throne, things are already better. It's not that it's going to get better. Your life is already set up to be better. God has a plan. Do not quit. Somebody say, do not quit. Say, do not quit. So when people become hard to bear as well, just as Jesus was long-suffering, Jesus was, was patient. So I always tell people this. When people are hard to, 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 to bear with, remember that you two are also hard to deal with. Me, I know I'm hard to deal with. I don't care. It is what it is. So because I know that, I, know I, I also need to be patient with other people. Also understand this. We are all unique. We are all different. And because we're all different, what does that mean? It means that because I'm different and you're different, we're not all going to like the same things. And because of that, there's going to be differences. So I must have an understanding that we're not always going to get along. So we should have patience for one another. You should have patience. Look to your neighbor and say, I should have patience for you. And I always said, if Christ still saved you after all you went through, Remember, he could save somebody else as well. If everything you've done, our sister was telling her story. If she ain't telling me her story, I would have never known. If I see her today singing, I'm thinking that's just her story. No, people have been through some things. People have gone through things. But I've come to realize that everybody has a story. But when the glory of God appears, your story changes. Everybody say amen. amen. 
So that is the fruit, the fruit of patience. We see God is patient. Christ was patient. He was long-suffering. God was long-suffering. And we must also be patient and long-suffering as Christ is our example. But we look at the fruit of kindness. Somebody say the fruit of kindness. The Greek word for kindness is charetoros. Sorry. Let's just keep it moving. Let's go. All right. Which signifies more <laughs> than kindness, all right, as a quality. Y'all can stop laughing. It's all good. All right. <laughs> you know, I have to go that, got to go through that quick. All right. Which signifies more than kindness as a quality. It is kindness in righteous action. Kindness expressing itself in deeds. So it's not just a quality, but it's an action. This kindness we're talking about in Galatians 22 to 23 is not just something of a part. Oh, it's kind. No, we're talking about action. Somebody say action. Somebody say action. Action. Say it again. In order to be kind to others, you need to put yourself in their shoes. Sometimes you need to figure out, like, man, if I went through that, how would I want somebody else to help me? If I was going through what they went through, how would I want somebody else to be of help to me? Sometimes when you have to be, you have to put yourself in that person's shoes. Being kind means being willing to do something. Being kind is a verb. It's an action. Uh, how was somebody kind to you? You go to church. How were they kind to you? Oh, they smiled at me. See, you smiled and it was an action. Oh, how, how's that person kind? Oh, they, when I came to church, they, they gave me a hug. That person's kind. Oh, how were they kind to you? Oh, they gave me some money they didn't have to give me, and that person is kind. There's an action that is with kindness. Somebody say action. The reason I want you to get this is because a lot of us are kind with our mouth, but we're not kind with our hands. We're not kind with our feet. So I think we need to really understand that the kindness that Paul is talking about in Galatians 5 has to do with action. God showed his kindness to Israelites, to the Israelites, and also to us. When you look at Isaiah chapter 63, Isaiah chapter 63, verse 7, he says, I will tell of the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for Israel, according to his compassion and many kindness. So Israel can testify of the kindness of God the Father. Why? Because when they got to the Red Sea, they were able to see that the sea parted. It was God's kindness that parted the sea for them. They had seen his kindness in many other ways. When they needed food, it would just come down from heaven. He was kind unto them by giving them food. In the New Testament, or for us today, how do we see God's kindness? We, threw it, we see it through his son appearing on earth. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Giving is the kindness of God. His love is there, but then his kindness was shown in the giving. So God gave to us, and I'm sure there are many other things that we can see that God has been kind to us. There are some things that God has taken you out of with his mighty hand that if you were still in that thing, you would have been dead by now. But because of his kindness, he took you out. Sam, can you, po can you post a picture for me real quick? The kindness of God, sometimes we play down on it because we truly don't understand. If it had not been for God on your side, truly, where would you be? The, the Bible says that, that, that we have escaped the snare of the fowler. How did you escape? It was the hand of God that, that, that told you, watch out. When you were about to fall into that trap, God's hand said, no. And that's his kindness being shown in action. Somebody say action. Somebody say action. Do you have that picture, boss? Now, let me tell you something. We have a brother here, Stephen. Stephen, can you stand up? Stephen talks about how he was drunk off his head. He was, I'm talking about, I mean, when he tells me the story, he's like, bro, I did not know what I was doing. And I went into the, 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 the car and I drove home. When we got into the worst, I wanted to show you the picture of the car. The car was so banged up that you cannot even phantom how a human being can still survive out of that. Is, there, is, it, is it ready? Now, I tell people all the time that kindness should not be played with. Because God does so many things for us. That if it had not, some of the things, I always tell people, 
The greatest miracle in your life are the things that you didn't see. You didn't see it because God's hand delivered you from it. His kindness in action. His kindness in action. Somebody say his kindness in action. So Jesus himself was also kind. How was Jesus kind? That when he was on earth, haven't you noticed that every time somebody comes to interrupt Jesus, he's, uh, uh, somebody comes to Jesus, they're interrupting him from doing something. Jesus is walking, the lady with the issue of blood is just like, I need to touch the hem of his garment, touches him. What does Jesus do? He stops and shows them kindness. Some of us, if it was us, if it was me, forget some of y'all, I have trouble stopping for people because I got a calendar, I got to meet, I got a schedule, I got a place to go to. You touch me, all right, I got to keep going. But they touched Jesus, but what happened? Jesus stopped and showed their kindness. You see this picture? How, I, I don't think it's even that clear. But Stephen was able to escape the snare of the fire. That guy, can't put the light down for me, bro. You probably don't know, you got it. God bless you. Look at this. This is what we call the kindness of God. That we thank God that Stephen doesn't look like this. He doesn't look like what the devil had planned for him. God, the devil knew that if we let this man live, he'll be able to accomplish that which God has for his life. So what does the devil do? He sets us up so that we will fall, set us up so that we will die, so that very thing that God has planned for us will not come to pass. That's why Jesus says, I have come to give life and give it more abundantly, but the enemy has come to steal, kill, and to destroy. That's what he tried to do to our brother. But God's kindness, somebody say God's kindness. God's kindness. And some of y'all, just because you haven't seen the accident, doesn't mean the enemy didn't plan it for you. It's his kindness that stressed his eye. The Bible says his hand is not too short to save, nor is his ear deaf to hear. It means that the hand of God could be reached into some places that man's hand cannot go. And that's when his kindness is seen and he just brings you out. Tell you, I don't know how you survived, but I thank God for his kindness. Turn the light, turn the light on. The kindness of God. The kindness of God. Guys, Jesus was kind. They stopped him. They'll, they'll do something. And then Jesus will stop. Blind, uh, blind, uh, is it blind? Bartimius, yes. I'm about to say Barcelona. Whatever. So, so tell me, this dude, he's like, Jesus, son of David, have what? Mercy on me. What did Jesus do? He stopped and addressed the situation. When Jesus was trying to have a dinner and have a meal, the Bible says a woman came and used her hair to anoint his feet. Jesus could have said, bro, I'm eating. Don't you see? Like, bro, chill out. No, it's the kindness of God. You see, what I'm saying sounds right to the flesh. But when the spirit of God cultivates the fruit of the spirit, which is kindness, you're able to stop and be inconvenient so that other people can experience Jesus. Amen. It's a level. That's why your flesh can't do it. That's why you're always irritated. That's why you don't want to help people because you're walking too much in the flesh. But let the spirit take over so that you can stop thinking about yourself and find ways to help people and present Christ to them. Help, help people and let them know Christ. Jesus was eaten. She interrupted him and he showed mercy. How I'm going to make this practical to you is I took this myself. Doing ministry, it's not always about prayer, prayer, Bible study, prayer, prayer, Bible study. No, people got lives, they need kindness. People are going through some things, they need help, right? And if it's an action, it's not just say, brother, God bless you. No, it's brother, how much do you need? Let me take it out of my wallet, action, and let me place it in your hand so you can use it for something. But because that fruit of the spirit is not in us, we're just thinking of ourselves and our flesh is selfish. That's why people cheat, that they can care less about their wife or their, or their couple because their flesh is saying, satisfy yourself. But the spirit of God that has self-control will tell you, don't think about yourself. Think about the testimony that could be defiled. Think about Jesus. Think about that just because you slept, look, just because you slept with her, nobody knew. Nobody knows. You, 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 you mess up that relationship you even have. You're just sitting there and you think you can, play, you can be prideful and just say that, oh, he sees it, but he'll forgive me. Nah. The flesh is selfish, but the Spirit of God teaches us kindness. Somebody say kindness. kindness. Jesus had kindness. He showed it. He showed it so beautifully. David showed kindness. Even when Saul was trying to take out David. We all know the story. Saul just wanted to kill him. 
And then the son of David, which his name is Jonathan, he became best friends. And Jonathan said, bro, promise me that you will not kill off everybody in my family, like, but you show some mercy. He said, don't worry. I'll definitely show some kindness to you. The Bible says Jonathan and Saul both die. But David remembers the oath he made with Jonathan. And he says, who is in the house of, not Jonathan, but the house of Saul? Bruh, if it's the flesh, you would say, Saul hated me. I loved Jonathan. So who is in the house of Jonathan? He said, who is in the house of the man that wanted to take my life? Who is in the house of the man that couldn't stand me? Who is in the house of the man that wanted to get me fired? The man that didn't like me. The man that gossiped about me. The man that set me up to kill me many times. Who is in his house that I can show him the kindness of God? The scripture says it clearly. It says not just any kindness. He says to him, Who, where can I show the kindness of God? There's regular kindness and there's the kindness of God. The kindness of men is that I give you something because you're going to give me something in return. The kindness of God is I give it to you. I don't care what you give me back. The kindness of God. And the Bible says he showed it to the son of Jonathan. He showed that kindness to him. So what are the practical kindnesses we can show in our life? I tell people this all the time. When you get up. I started doing this now that I live in Baltimore. There are so many, so many, so many homeless people. And, and when I read the scripture, scripture tells us how we should help the needy. So many scriptures. I mean, so many of them. Proverbs 14, 21, it says, it is a sin to despise one neighbor, but blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. Proverbs 14, 31 says, whoever oppresses the poor shows content for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. So what you're saying, you're not just honoring the person that you're helping, you're also honoring God. Proverbs 19, 17 says, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the, to the Lord. And he will reward them for what they have done. So when you see men that are living a life of rewards, it doesn't mean they went to do soccer ball 419 anywhere. Some of them have given to the needy and the Lord has rewarded them. So when I'm blessed today, don't come and tell me some nonsense that I went to still church money. No, and God has honored me because I've honored the Lord. I'm sorry, I, just sometimes, you know. <laughs> But it's annoying. Somebody can look at you and be like, when do you come into money? What do you mean? Sometimes people can bless you because you've blessed others. Scripture shows us that God can reward us for helping the needy. So because of this, when I read these scriptures, now when I go to work, I have cash on me. Always have cash on me. I'm trying to be as practical as possible. You just need to make sure, like, I wake up today and I ask the Lord, who can I thank today? It's an action. Pick up my phone. There's some people that keep saying, stop thanking me. Ronnie is here. Ronnie will tell you. He'd be like, bro, stop thanking me, bro. It's too much, man. I said, no, bro. I want to show you the kindness of God because you didn't have to do what you did. The job I have, I show my boss. Can't see. He always says, man, you're so humble. You did an African thing. I said, yo, if I do the African thing, uh, uh, the Venezuela thing, Brazilian thing, I don't care. All I'm trying to tell you is that I thank you for giving me an opportunity to work here. I wake up and I say, Lord, who do I thank today? Number two, I also say, where can I give a, sm a smile or a word of appreciation? So I called, I remember I called Deaconess Grace. I said, Grace, I love your smile. So Elder, stop being here. <laughs> oh, Elder, that's to me. I said, no, keep on smiling because somebody's deliverance is in your smile. Your kindness is attached to your action. When you smile, you're showing the kindness of God and saying, welcome to the house of the Lord. I pray you have a good day. That one encounter can shift somebody and say, somebody actually cares about me. Kindness. Somebody say kindness. A word of appreciation. I call people, I say, look, good job. If you did a good job, I'll tell you you did a good job. If you didn't do a good job, I'll also tell you you didn't do a good job. But also, I'll do all those things in the kindness of God. Amen. So what I'm saying is that Give people a smile. Give people word of appreciation. Um, like, find ways. Now, I help the homeless. And it's beautiful that I can get to do it with my job as well. And find ways in helping homeless people. Um, another thing you can do um, is maybe meet the needs of the homeless. When they come in, I just say that, hey, I have to prepare before I come home, before I leave home, to make sure that I have cash for anybody that's coming. I don't think about what they're going to use their money for. I'm not thinking about, hey, man, he's going to get some more drugs. 
what I'm doing is my part. From my heart, I'm saying that I want to bless you so that you can have a better day than yesterday. That's, that's what I'm thinking about. And just like David say, said, who can I show the kindness of the Lord to? When you wake up tomorrow, Kwame, do that. Be like, who can I show the kindness of the Lord to? Be like David. Like this practical message. If the Holy Spirit is in you, he will give you a desire to ask, who can I bless? My wife would tell, me, tell you, I've, ever since I married her, she's taught me how to, I was a stingy boy, bro. Stingy. My wife has taught me how not to be stingy. And I've realized now that I've lo losing my hand, there's a lot of more money that's coming into my hand now. Look, that's why you meant, but you must marry a good woman. Oh. Bro, I didn't see this blessing coming until my wife showed up. But she showed me kindness. When we meet men of God, we just, hey, men of God, God bless you. We enter the house and we give a prophet a prophecy word. Here. I don't need anything for you. Don't pray for you. I don't care. What I'm doing is I'm just partnering with you and saying that God bless you for the work that you're doing. Continue. And whatever this can do, if it can buy you Coke, water, cookies, or help you with rent, use it. But I know when you use it to the glory of God, my blessing is also there. Amen. Wake up and say, who can, I be a who can I bless today? You need to be practical with this. Who can you show the kindness of the Lord to? And you know when you know it's real, it's when you bless your enemies. Look, David said, who is in the house of Saul? Not the house of, he could have, look, the guy was the son of Jonathan. He could have kept it short and just said, the house of Jonathan. But he said, nah, this is not any regular kindness. This is the kindness of the Lord. And it transcends those who help me to those who actually speak against me. That's who I want to bless. Somebody say the kindness of the Lord. I pray may the Holy Spirit cultivate that for you. Because if C3 becomes a church that shows the kindness of the Lord, everybody will get along. Everybody will want to come to the house of God, not just for the word, but for fellowship, knowing that even through your hello, there's deliverance. Even through your hug, there's power. Even through your handshake, there's something inside of it. And what is it? It is the kindness of the Lord that is being pushed into you. The kindness of the Lord. The last one is the fruit of goodness. And we're done. The Greek word for goodness is agasun. Yes. Hey, please. You know, Charlie, it's okay. Yes. Agatusun. Agata is coming soon. No, nah, I'm playing. So, agatusun. Right? That's the Greek word. If I ain't say it right, it's Greek. So, it's all good. But this is what it means. An uprightness of heart and life. An uprightness of heart and life. Now, God's nature is upright, and he does no wrong. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. It says, he is the rock. His works are perfect. Somebody say perfect. And all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just he is. So we see that the nature of God that God exemplifies the fruit of goodness because the definition of it is an uprightness of heart and of life. So God's nature is he does no wrong. He's always upright. God is so good that everything about him is goodness. That is why when we say that God can turn a bad situation into good, why? Because his character, when he steps into a thing, it all, the whole situation turns into what he wants it to be and he can only do what he is and who he is and he makes sure that situation even though it is bad, he makes sure it turns into good. That's why Romans chapter 8, I believe verse 8, one of my favorite scriptures, I forgot if it's Romans 8, 28, right? And, 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 and I don't know, it just skipped my mind. Uh, Romans 8, um, oh, oh, no, this, I, I know this one, I know this one. Please give me, just like the Greek is giving, doing me, let me also get this one. Romans 8, 28, it says, uh, all things work out for the good of those that, are lo that love the Lord and are called according to his what? Purpose. All things, all things, all things, meaning that the situation that was bad, 
God can turn it and make it good. The situation that seemed terrible, God can use that and turn it around and make it good. Why? Because he himself is good. That is why Joseph saw his brothers and said, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. And so God uses every situation and makes sure that his DNA, his fingerprints are attached to it. How do you know he's attached to it? Because goodness is all over it. So your life, don't say that uh, life is done for me because everything looks bad. No, it's not over yet. God is preparing us. For something good. And even if it's suffering, it's still good. Because at the end of the day, we live in eternity with him. So what we must understand is that goodness is all over God. Daniel exemplified this kind of goodness. The goodness we're talking about in Galatians. Daniel lived it. The Bible says that when the people saw that Daniel was doing well, he was going up in the ranks. They said that we need to do something about this man. But the only thing they could do against him was use his goodness against him. That means you've got another level when they can't find anything wrong about you, but they use the good that you do against you. So the Bible says he went to them and goes, to, they go to the king and say, King, anybody that prays to, the, to, to any other God but you should be thrown to lions then. Look at that. They looked at a man's goodness and said that there's no other way we can set you up but by using your goodness. Same thing happened to Jesus. They said, the Pharisees came and said, bro, you are a man of integrity. So when your enemies are coming to you about bad things, you need to check your life. You need to say, they need to see like, ah, sister, because you're always singing so much to the girl, because you're always telling men that, no, we can't have sex before marriage. No, because you're always telling women, because women pressure men too a lot. That's the next section. Now I'm playing, but, but what I'm saying is that because we, we stand for righteousness, let our enemies come to us about the righteousness of God in our life. Let our enemies say, like even when you look at the enemies of God in Israel, they, they speak so well of God's power because God was always consistent with who he was. And this is talking about a moral life you must live. People must see you and say that you are so good that we're using that against you. You may say that, how do I do this? Yes, with your flesh, you can't do it. But with the fruit of the Spirit and the Spirit of the Lord, cultivating that inside of you, you should be able to do it because it's not by might, it's not by power. But it's truly by the Spirit of God. So Jesus was a man showed goodness even though he was kind and he helped people you saw his goodness in his uprightness when he went into the temple and he beat everybody up for selling stuff in the in the temple so even though we say jesus is kind where was his goodness his goodness was presented when he said that you must be right the house of the lord is a house of prayer so you should be a person that should be able to go into places though you're kind doesn't mean people need to play you as a fool People must understand that we stand for Christ, we stand in his word, and anybody that is against that, we use the word of God to correct and to rebuke. So Jesus, though he was nice, he still pulled out a whip and whipped some people. That's why I tell people that just because you're a Christian doesn't mean people have to play you for a fool. The Proverbs wouldn't be in the, in the, in the scripture if God wanted us to be fools. If, if God wanted us to be fools, Proverbs wouldn't be there. The life of Christ wouldn't be there. So we must stand for righteousness. We must stand for what is right. The thing that the enemy wants to do with your life is that he wants to taint your ministry, taint your testimony. That the day you stand up to give a testimony is the day he will send some things around the way just so people will see you and then use that bad day against your whole life. Oh, that day, and that's the people. They'll be like, oh, yeah, she's singing, but I remember this. So that's why I tell people, don't give the enemy any foothold. Make sure you watch your life. The Bible says, be very vigilant, be sober-minded for the enemy. He's looking to see how he can devour you so that your testimony is tainted. So we must be like an army of Christ, always alert, ready that when we feel like falling, the strength of God keeps us going. When we feel like giving up, the strength of God keeps us going. When you don't feel like praying because people are after your prayer life like Daniel, you say, I don't care. If my life is not in your hands, then God can protect me from anybody. And I don't fear the one that can kill the body. I actually fear the one that can kill the body and the soul. 
So we must be a church that is kind, but we must also be stern when it comes to the word of God. Not everything that you post, everybody's posting. I see people posting, somebody will just be there, like, uh, let me say, any celebrity, they're kind of dressing, the kind of things, and they were the kind of people who would be sharing along with the world. Like, what is that about? Then when you want to tell your friend, I was telling Benny about this uh, this week. We were talking about sometimes, I used to go through that. There was one time I was at school, and I told this dude that, bro, I stopped going to parties for two months. So at that time, I thought I was high. I told dude, I said, bro, you need to stop. Dude was like, bro, you was with me just two months ago. Forget it. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that if you don't have a track record and we don't see the fruits being produced, it is hard to convince others about Christ. Because why? The fruits being in our lives is really not that we just have a good life. We have a good spiritual life. But people need to come to Christ through how we exemplify Christ's likeness. So if we're not doing that, then people will always have something to say. So I tell people all the time, it's not that, you know, people are always against you. Sometimes you'll be playing the fool. You got to keep it 100. You didn't have to go there. You didn't have to talk to this person. You should have been, you should have been stern. You should have been right. Yes, I, I was afraid. No, you should be stern when it comes to the word of God. Because the day you stand to tell somebody something, Trust me, they're looking for a loophole to poke. But just like Daniel, they couldn't find nothing but his faithfulness to God. May it be said of you that they will not find anything. And anything that they find, it will be in the past. But from today on, there will be nothing that they can say from this day on about your life. I'm telling you, it's, it sucks. When you're there, a pastor fornicates and then, and then boom, it's in trouble. This happens, and then it's hard to defend to defend Christianity. It's hard because people are like, bro, but is it, that's your pastor. Is it? That's your man's, right? That's your boy. I'm not saying we're going to be perfect, but let's keep in mind that people are going to come after us. So we have to do what is right. And it's my prayer that the fruit of patience will be birthed in you, that you know how to relate to others and be patient with them as Christ was patient with you. I pray that the fruit of kindness will be birthed in you so that you will be able to be kind unto people, not just with your mouth, but with action. And I pray that you also show goodness, that you'll be able to stand for the word, that when they come after your life, they will just say what God has done and how you've lived for them. Let that be your portion in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's stand up and begin to pray. Father. I pray for everybody in this place. And Father, I ask, before we start to pray, that if any of us are struggling with any fruit, I pray just like you visited me in my room two years ago, and I felt your presence all over me. And from that day, there was a change. I pray in the name of Jesus, may that be their portion now in Jesus' name. Place your hand where on your heart. And I want you to begin to pray. You know, if you struggle with patience, pray that the Lord will give you patience. If you struggle with kindness, it's hard for you to smile. You have an attitude. Your heart is hard for you to show accent. It's hard for you. Begin to just pray and say, Lord, help me be kind. Let, let me help those that even hurt me because that's what you did while we were yet sinners. Christ came and died. While we were yet enemies, he came and died. May we be like Christ. And if you're struggling in your walk, it's hard for you to be morally right. It's hard for you to stand on his word and you're always giving excuses. Pray that may the Lord sustain your feet and let your feet be strong. Let the foundation, come on, lift up your voice and pray. Let the Spirit of the Lord work on you. Come on. Just, just speak to him. Just, just, be, just be real with him.
some of you the enemy the bible says he's the accuser of the brethren so because his title is accuser every day he's looking for something to make you look stupid today tell god may he keep your feet and make you strong say today may goodness be seen all over you that even if they come accusing me ah may god be able to say look at my servant isn't he a good one he said the same thing to job and and, and and satan said hey it's only because he has things but job was able to keep standing come on will you be able to stand when the enemy comes with temptation Will you be able to stand? Will you be able to know that truly you stand for God? When we go through these things, God is testing us to really see, do we know that he's with us? Come on. Some of you have been failing the same test. You've been failing the same thing. You've allowed the enemy to get his best way with you. But today, enough is enough. May you be able to stand when the enemy comes knocking at the door. May you be able to stand morally for God. Come on, come on, lift your voice and pray. Some of you, when you look at these three fruits, wherever you lack, begin to pray. Some of you, you're, you're, you're not patient. You're, you're always irritated. Sometimes you're, you're upset. Something always triggers you. When somebody says something that you don't like, we don't see the Christian inside of you anymore. But today, may you be long-suffering. May you have forbearance. May you forgive people that begin to show their weaknesses to you. May you have a forgiving heart. Jesus Father we give ourselves away we give ourselves away today ah. patience some of you need to erase some things from your mind that's the trigger that causes you to be irritated it's that very thing that when you see that person when you, when you see that person you get upset and patience is just out the door but remember, if God was patient with you, it must be patient with others. Some of you, you need to wake up tomorrow and say, Lord, who can I show the kindness of God to? Some of you, you've been saving and saving and saving. And God has been pricking your heart and saying that, give to the needy. Give to those that need help. Help, help, help. Help some people. Some of you need to go up to some people and just say, how can I help you? The Spirit of the Lord talks to some of us and says, help this person, but, but you just don't want to because you don't have, you're lacking kindness. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. You know, before I pray, I want to do something. Everybody take out your phone. Right? Everybody take out your phone or whatever you use to give. Whatever you used to give, I want to do something. When I was working on this message, the Holy Spirit told me to do this. I called the leadership and we agreed to do it. Today's offering, everything that comes in the offering today, right, is going to help anybody in this church that is going through financial issues. We need to show the kindness of God. If we can't find the kindness of God in the house of God, then where should we go? Why is Salvation Army and them doing the job that the church should be doing? Something that starts Christian and then it turns to a secular thing that now they have to, they can't be project Christ anymore because they're doing government agencies. See, the thing is that the world wants you to do it their way and when you do it their way, they tell you don't say Jesus. And when you don't say Jesus and if you're a leader and all you want is money, all you do is you put Jesus under the ground. But we, if we're the church, we should do more than Salvation Army. We should do more than Goodwill. We should show kindness. Tell you, some people are suffering. So today, can we have the offering things on the on the board, please? On the thing. Now look, the tight, the tight goes to help pay the rent and those things. But whatever comes to offering, so make sure you put it in your memo that this is offering. If you're not paying your tight in this offering, you can give it, it goes straight to them. Um, but the offering is going to anybody in this house that you're going through something. If it's just gas. You know, a lady hit me last week. 
was like, she lives far. And she, I was like, why did you come to church? I didn't have gas money. I had to save, I had to save what I have for work up until Thursday. That shouldn't be a reason why somebody doesn't come to church. If all of us got good jobs, some of y'all make hundreds of thousands. Some of y'all make six figures. Some of us make like good bread. Why should somebody be tripping about gas? Then when we say, hey, how you doing? God bless you. Nah. James said, nah, we don't, we don't do that. You, you need to show kindness. It's an action. So look, this is how we give. If you're tight, please, you pay. That's what we do is to pay the, the, the bills in the house. But the offering, just make an indication that this is going towards offering or this is going towards tight. So the accountants will know what to do. But everything that comes into offering, if you're here, please don't lie. If you just want a new Louis bag, don't come over here, bro. Okay? If you want a new Gucci bag, don't get in here, you're going to get it. Anybody that is looking for help. You can't pay for a book. You, you need gas money. You need some help. I don't know what's going to come in. So I can't promise you what we can do. But we want to be there for you. It ain't easy, bro. I've, I've been there. So wherever you are, just go ahead and give. Go ahead and give. This is tithes and offering section of service. But I'm just letting everybody know we're going to help. And if that is you, please come and see me after service. See me after service. Because we must be the hands of God. If we're really doing this thing called fruit of the spirit, we must be practical with it. Show somebody kindness. And if you've done that already, if you've, if you've given your tithe and your offering, just lift up your hands and so I know who's done it yet. Just lift your hands high so I just know we'll give more time. Okay. Just give one more minute and let's 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 support people here, please. Let's support. Let's support people. Let's be a house that supports each other. Amen. Oh, amen. I said amen. Are y'all angry about this or something? Nah, this is what we need to do. If you don't like it, then hey. I don't know, but this is what Christ would ask us to do. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the offering. We thank you for the tithes that were brought in. We ask, oh God, that as we are giving to give back, may you bless those and reward those that have given from a pure heart. I ask in the name of Jesus that if anybody in this place is going through so much, I ask, oh God and my Lord, that may you show them kindness. May you step into their situation and help them. Father, I pray that you be able to help those that feel like there is no light anywhere. Those who are even battling sicknesses, Father, let your healing hand heal them in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray, oh God, that may this offering be a pleasing sacrifice to you and I ask in the name of Jesus that may you bless us with more resources so we can bless more people that it will be a church that will bless a church that will love in the mighty name of Jesus and everybody shout a big amen